Battle of Rome. Ditto. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. This country is at war with Germany. The Second World War began on the morning of September the 3rd, 1939. Barely nine months later, in May 1940, that war was all but lost. Yet if the course of the Second World War in Britain can be said to have had a first decisive turning point, then this is where its centre lay. Deep inside the white cliffs of Dover looking out over what was to be one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world, Hellfire Corner. But of course, life is exciting at Dover. If a convoy passes through the channel, as they still pass, this happens. Britain went to war in 1939, there was little of the excitement that had marked the outbreak of the First World War. Merely an acceptance of the inevitable. This was to be a war of the civilian population as much as the military. And as the British expeditionary force left for France, everyone in the country prepared for the conflict to come. Gordon delivers the meat, the fruiter is a policeman, the news agent runs the first aid, the shop assistant drives an ambulance. Windows were taped against bomb blasts. Precautions were taken against gas attacks. In the frontline counties, road signs were removed. Air raid shelters were built. Gun emplacements and trenches hurriedly prepared to meet the expected invasion of German paratroops. And the children were evacuated. As autumn faded into winter, then winter into spring, still the German bombers had not come. Across the channel, the opposing armies remained deadlocked behind the immense fortifications of the German Siegfried and the French Maginot lines. But for all the popular relief at what was coming to be known as the Phony War, several secret defence projects first initiated in the government rearmament white paper of 1936 were nearing completion. Along the cliff tops of the southeast, the world's first fully operational radar defense network was now in place to warn of enemy aircraft crossing the channel. strengthening of coastal defences were these tunnels beneath Dover Castle, transformed from their 19th century origins into an underground command centre that would guard the Straits of Dover. Then, as now, the chalk rock of the Dover area made for relatively easy tunnelling. Over a century earlier, when fears of an invasion by the armies of Napoleon were widespread, the first deep shafts had been sunk into the cliff face. Huge brick-lined casemates like these, a total of six in all, complete with ventilation shafts, access and storage space, were probably designed to contain a battery of 36-pound cannons for the defence of Dover Harbour against French attack. World War I saw the casemates back in Admiralty use, a focus of naval defence of the Straits. But it wasn't until the advent of the Second World War that the real strategic value of the Napoleonic tunnels emerged. 
In the spring of 1940, German forces swept through the Ardennes in a dramatic surprise attack that broke through the Allied lines to encircle and trap the British and French armies at the port of Dunkirk. As the Dunkirk crisis unfolded, Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey and his staff planned and controlled the entire Allied evacuation from within these walls. His HQ at the end of the sixth casemate giving him a panoramic view of the channel. For here, within clear sight of enemy occupied France, was established a major operation centre hidden well away from view and safe from enemy bombers. From their separate quarters and adjoining casemates, the Navy could monitor German naval operations. The RAF, working closely with the Navy, could identify build-ups of enemy aircraft long before they became visible. And the Army could track enemy shipping and observe enemy gun positions on the coast of France, communicating direct with a 4,000-strong coastal artillery force. Winston Churchill, by now Prime Minister, paid several visits to Dover in the early years of the war to inspect coastal defences and for operational conferences. Battle of Britain and throughout the years that followed, deep inside these top secret control rooms, a combined services staff of around 200 personnel worked right around the clock, tracking enemy movements in the air and far out to sea. Gathering information from radar and shipping sources and translating it into signals for the coastal defense batteries. For ARIA Fighter Command, and for civilian air raid warnings. The centre had its own telephone exchanges with a staff of two dozen engineers. Later came other levels, with a hospital, dressing station, and living accommodation all built underground, supervised by the Royal Engineers to make an estimated total of around three and a half miles of tunnels. But the south of England now faced new hazards. The V-1 flying bomb, soon christened the Doodlebug. And the even more sinister V-2, the world's first supersonic rocket missile, launched against Britain in 1944. This was to prove an eerie portent of the tunnel's main post-war function. In the 1960s, the years following the Cuban Missile Crisis, the tunnels were extensively re-equipped and overhauled under Home Office instructions to form a regional seat of government for the county of Kent in the event of a nuclear war. The tunnels now even had their own broadcasting studio. Here were to live around 100 of the official administrators of Britain after the bomb. Faced with the impossible task of trying to ensure the safety and welfare of the surviving population, Weekend courses were held for local government officers to learn to recognize and cope with the hazards of atomic warfare. Happily, they never needed to put their training into practice. By the 1980s, the cost of maintaining the tunnels for their role as a nuclear shelter became simply too high to be practical, 
and following the Defence Force's decision to move out in 1986, they were finally taken off the secrets list. In their time, they have helped protect Britain against the threats of Napoleon, the Kaiser, and nuclear war. But who can doubt that it was during the early years of World War II that these tunnels saw their finest hour. The sea at dawn is grey, sombre as metal with dull, unvarnished strength. The light expands till the horizon once more defined encircles our day. There. Tomorrow, just 